say um, the topic is about angular motion. So I'm going to spend half of the class talking about the angular motion equation. I will compare the angular motion equation with the uh, uh, linear motion equation and tell you the, uh, the common points and the difference. And then I will show you uh, two examples, how to use the equation to solve the parameters in the angular motion. Then um, I will spend half of the class talking about the torque. I think the torque will be the new, com uh, the, the new physical uh, topics in this class. So I will give you some introduction of the history and who uh, discovered the torque and why do we need torque. And then I give you some derivation, how the torque could be calculated by using the inertia, the moment of inertia and also the force and the radius. So let me start from the angular motion equation. So first one, if we have a straight motion and we have five parameters talking about uh, this linear motion. For example, we have uh, uh, initial velocity is V0 and uh, final velocity, time, linear acceleration, and the displacement. Um, so those five parameters used to describe the motions. And if we have a constant acceleration, then we have four equations. And the four equations contact uh, the relations uh, of every four parameters, then if we know three parameters, you can solve the rest of two. Then in the angular motion, we have the similar um, parameters. For example, in the linear motion, we have initial velocity, and we also have initial velocity in the angular motion. For example, if we start from here to here, then the initial velocity will be in this direction. So this is a tangential uh, velocity and the direction of this velocity is pointing uh, right down. Okay, so this is a velocity initial. And at the ending point, we have, in, we have final velocity. The direction goes in this way and left down. That's a final velocity. And you will find that the direction of the velocity change over time. But if we look at the straight motion, the direction of the velocity doesn't change, right? Uh, sometimes it goes to the different direction, but they are parallel or inter-parallel. So we can just use a positive sign or negative sign to represent as a velocity. But in the angular motion, you will find that the velocity and the final velocity are not parallel or end of parallel. So the tangential velocity is not a good parameter to use um, when we want to describe the angular motion. So we want a parameter to describe the motion and that parameter should be constant in some region or that constant is easy to handle. But if we use the linear uh, axis, at the linear velocity or the tangential velocity, we will find that the magnitude is different and the direction is not the same. So if we use this parameter to describe the angular motion, the calculation will be very difficult. And it's complicated to use this parameter um, if we want to analyze angular motion. Then what should we do to uh, change another parameter and use a new parameter to describe uh, the speed of the motion. We use angular velocity here. Uh, we use angular velocity. The angular velocity from the uh, circular motion we know, this is defined as the linear velocity or tangential velocity over the radius. So suppose the radius r. And we use a velocity over as r, that's angular velocity. Um, so the reason we use this one is uh, you don't need to care about the direction, right? In this case, at different position, the angular velocity had different value. 
but you don't need to worry about the, the direction. It's hard to say what's the direction of the angular velocity. So the reason we use angular velocity is um, the only thing can change is the value of the angular velocity. You don't need to worry about the, the direction. So we have initial angular velocity to replace the initial tangential velocity. And we have final velocity, angular velocity to replace the final tangential velocity. The third parameter we use to describe the angular motion is time. Okay, we have time. And for the, for the acceleration, we use angular acceleration. Angular acceleration. So how do we define the angular acceleration? We have tangential acceleration that's equal to A. We divide by the radius. That's uh, angular acceleration. Okay, so this is uh, how we define the angular acceleration. And in this case, you don't have to worry about the direction of angular acceleration. Okay? But if you check the tangential acceleration at this point, the A could be in this way or could be in this way. And at this point, the A could be in this way or could be in this way. So the direction of the acceleration change. So acceleration is not a good parameter to describe the angular motion. That's why we use angular acceleration. Okay. Then the last parameter is the displacement. So in the displacement, we don't want to use the distance from this point to this point, because if we use this definition, we will find this is not linear and there's a curve. And to measure the, the length of the curve is very hard. So we don't use the length of curve to represent displacement, we use angle. So we use angle to represent the displacement. We call the angle as angular displacement, or we just call the angle. The next thing is the unit. Let's check the unit for each parameter. The angular velocity uh, equals the linear velocity over the radius. The linear velocity we know the unit is meter per second. The radius unit is meter. So angular velocity has a unit of one over second. Or you can just use second minus one, or you can use a angle over the time. So the angle is radian over time, the second. And here I want to emphasize the radian is not a unit. This is a dimensionless number. So radian and the one, actually they are dimensionless. So the three units are the same. Time, we use second, and no more things I want to talk. And the acceleration, angular acceleration, let's check the unit. Uh, for the tangential acceleration, we have meter per second square. And the denominator is a meter. So the angular acceleration has a unit per second square. Okay. And the angle, angle is a dimensionless uh, parameter. So we can use radian or we just keep it empty. You don't need to put any unit behind the angle. Okay, so that's the parameters in the angular motion. Then we are looking for equations uh, to link these parameters and how do we get um, the parameters in the angular motion if we know some of them. Here is uh, equations. So on the left, I just list all the equations in the linear motion. We already uh, tested uses equations in the first exam. And you also know if we know three parameters, we can solve the rest too. And if you want an uh, equation without acceleration, you can choose a 2.14. Uh, if you want an equation without displacement, you choose 2.8. And without final velocity, you choose 2.12. And if you don't want time, you choose 2.13. And the next um, part I want to say is if we replace the initial 
velocity with initial angular velocity. We replace the final velocity with the final angular velocity. We keep the time the same, and then we replace acceleration with angular acceleration, displacement with angle. Then we get a new equation. And these four equations are similar. Let's check. So V, I change into the omega, and A, I change into the alpha. Then I keep the, the rest the same. So we get the first equation. If we don't know the angle, we choose the first equation. The first equation, no angle. The second equation, we can compare this two. We have angle displacement. We have angular velocity. We have velocity here. We have angular acceleration, that's acceleration. Then that's the equation without fan of angular velocity. The third one, we don't have time. The last one, there's no angular acceleration. So that means if we know three parameters, we can pick up an equation to solve the rest of two. So this is how we do the calculation. If we have uh, three parameters in the angular motion. Okay, so this is uh, the equations and I, I want to help you to digest these equations, then I show you some examples. When we do this practice, that will be helpful for you to understand how to uh, use these equations. Okay. Uh, first one, there's a fan, and this fan has a constant acceleration. Okay. Angular acceleration, uh, the angular velocity decreases uniformly. So that means alpha is constant. Okay, this is very important. If alpha is constant, then we can use this four equation. Alpha should be constant. Then let's see. The initial velocity is 500 revolution per minute. Then it decreased to 200 revolution per minute in just a four second. Then find the angular acceleration in this unit and the number of revolutions made by the motor in just a four second interval. Uh, okay, so let's uh, separate these questions into two parts. First one, uh, we're going to find the angular acceleration. And how many parameters do we know? We know initial angular velocity at 500, and we know the final angular velocity at 200 and the time, four seconds. So we already have three parameters. So to get the acceleration, we are going to pick up uh, the first equation here. Change of the angular velocity equal to the angular acceleration multiplied by duration. So this one equal to initial angular velocity plus alpha times duration. Um, so let's unify the unit. We have revolution per minute. I'm going to convert into revolution per second. 500 revolution per minute, that means in just one minute, and this, the fan spin 500 circles. So if we just care about one second, how many circles this fan spin, we use 500 divided by 60. Right, so change into the Revolution per second, we use 500 divided by 60, 200 divided by 60. So we have final 200 by 60, 500 over by 60, plus um, deacceleration. So alpha is on no, times deacceleration per second. One second. So we get alpha. So alpha, let me check the solution. We get negative one a quarter. Then the unit is revolution per second squared. Okay, that's the first question. And second question, we are going to find uh, how many circles 
does the motor made in four seconds? Okay, couldn't find the how many revolutions. That's a question for the angle. We're looking for the angle. So if we want to have an angle, we have initial velocity, final angular velocity and time. We need the equation without acceleration. That's the last equation. We have initial, the final, and the time. Then we get the angle. Okay, so that's equal to one half initial velocity, final velocity, duration. Initial is 500 revolution per second, 200 revolution per second. Time is four seconds. So we get uh, the angle that's 23.3 uh, revolution. So that means in just four seconds, the fan spins uh, 23 circles. Let me take a pause here. Do you have any question? Okay, uh, if you don't have question, let me proceed. If you have any question, you can stop me. Part B, how many more seconds are required for the fan to come to rest if the acceleration remains constant? So acceleration, let me check the first part as a point, 1.25, so right here. We know acceleration, negative one and a quarter revolution per second square. This is what we know. And it says how many more seconds? So we start from uh, 200 revolution per, per minute. That's our initial velocity. We have initial angular velocity is 200 over 60 revolution per second. Final, come to rest, zero. Acceleration, negative one and a quarter revolution per second squared. So to solve the time, let's use the first equation. We have initial plus alpha times duration equals the final angular velocity. So we have final is zero, initial 200 over 60. Alpha is negative one and a quarter. And duration is what we're going to solve. So after the calculation, time is 2 and 67 seconds. Okay, so that's the first equation. Uh, the first problems I want to show you how to use the equation to calculate the parameters into the angular motion. The next problem I want to show you is, uh, I think the most important is to figure out the tangential acceleration and the, the radial acceleration. Okay, the first question, uh, three second and um, the rim of the wheel uh, has a tangential speed, okay? As the wheel shoots down the tangential acceleration, okay, they are all tangential and um, speed and acceleration. So we're going to calculate the angular acceleration and the angular velocity. So from the tangential to the angular, there is a factor of R. So we have acceleration, angular acceleration equal to acceleration over R, velocity, angular velocity equal to tangential velocity over R. That's easy. So that's a part A and a part B. We just use um, the, the number we have is 50, is 50, R is 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and A is, uh, negative 10 and R is point two. So we get the angular acceleration and angular velocity. Okay. So part C, through what angle did the wheel turn between 
zero to three. Okay, so we are looking for the angle. The angle we know, uh, let's see. Uh, we need to know the initial angular velocity. And then we also need to know uh, the final angular velocity and the time. So when we have this um, three parameter, we can solve the angle. We use this equation, initial angular velocity, final angular velocity multiplied by duration. Duration is three seconds. And this two angular velocity is from part B because we have angular velocity at three seconds and at zero seconds. So we have this two angular velocity that will get the angle. Okay. That's not difficult. Then I think trivial one, uh, the, the tricky question will be the part D. This is a little bit tricky. Let's see, at what time will the radio acceleration equal to G? Radio acceleration. What we talk about just now is tangential acceleration. Tangential acceleration here. And we know the tangential acceleration from description is negative 10. This is negative 10 and the direction goes in tangential direction. Now we're looking for the radial acceleration in this direction. The radial acceleration, if you still remember when we talk about the circular motion, the radial acceleration actually is a centripetal acceleration, right? Tripetal. Centripetal acceleration has a relation with angular velocity. A equal to angular velocity squared times the radius. That's the centripetal, let me see, the radial. Okay. And usually, most of the time, the radial acceleration and the tangential acceleration are independent because they are perpendicular. If they're independent, they don't have relation, but the radial acceleration has relation with the angular velocity. Okay. The angular velocity, we know it says at what time the radial acceleration is G. So that means we just equivalent this to G. Then we get angular velocity equal to G over R, then square root. G is 9.8, R is 0.2, here we have 0.2 meter. So the angular velocity is seven per second. This is uh, angular velocity. When we have the angular velocity we're looking for at what time? At what time? Omega is equal to seven. The initial one, we have initial velocity and let's see, from the part B, right? From part B, we have angular velocity. Let's use T equal to three seconds because at T equal to three seconds, we know the angle, uh, we know the tangential speed is 50. Okay, so the angular velocity will be 50 over 0.2, omega equal to 50 over 0.2, that's 250 per second. So initial is 250, then the acceleration we know is here, um, is negative 50 per second squared. So we have this one plus alpha t equal to omega. The final is seven, initial is 250, a is negative 50. Then we can solve the time. Time is equal to 4.86 seconds. And because this initial velocity uh, is at three seconds, right? it's at three seconds, t equal to three seconds. So we have to plus the total time 
will be equal to 4.86 for three seconds. So at 7.86 seconds, the radio acceleration equal to 9.8. Okay, that's uh, part D. And you can find that tangential acceleration only change the magnitude of the speed. And the radial acceleration only changed the direction of the speed. So that's the difference. Uh, do you have other questions? No questions? Okay, if there's no question, I'm going to move to the torque. The torque is a new parameter in physics. I think some of you might be the first time and to read this parameter. So I'm going to give you a short story about how we get the torque. So when we talk about torque, we need to introduce a person, a female physicist, engineer, mathematician, inventor, and astronomer. His name is Archimedes of Syracuse. The Syracuse, um, was a famous guy in the Greek. And he was famous because the king at that time liked Archimedes. And there's a story said the king got a gift from his friend. The gift is a crown. Draw a crown here. A crown. And the king's friend claimed the crown was made by gold, but the king was doubt. So he asked Archimedes to verify if this crown was made by gold. So how to verify the crown was made by gold without destroying or damaging the crown? And Archimedes found a method. First one, he has a baron and filled with water, the water. And he put this crown into the, the baron. And then the water just dripped. The water dripped and he used a small cup to get this dripped water. Then in this case, Archimedes obtained the volume of the crown. So he got the volume of the crown. And he used a balance to measure the mass of the crown. This is the balance and he used some counterweight to get the mass. Then he got the mass. Then he did some simple mass to get the, the density of the crown. The density of the crown is equal to the mass over the volume. Then he compare with the pure gold, the density of the pure gold. Pure gold. And he found that the density he measured is much smaller than density of the gold. So in this case, he said um, this crown was fake. It's a fake, this is a fake gold, and actually this uh, this crown was made by some wood and uh, stone. So in this case, Archimedes used a very simple experiment um, to verify this crown was fake. Uh, there was a very famous quote I need to hear from Archimedes. He said, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. So that means if there is a very long lever and a place to stand, then everything could be moved. So how he moved the world? Here, um, Archimedes stand here and on the Mars. Okay. You can think about this, not Archimedes, this is Elon Musk. He stand on the Mars and the same point is on the moon. Okay. And the earth is here and he has a very long lever. It's a very long bar. Okay. Then he just uh, push the bar on the Mars. Then the 
uh, the earth will be lift up. So we can think about that. Um, if we know the mass of the uh, of the earth, if we know the mass, and if we know the distance from the moon to the earth, from the moon to the Mars, then we need to calculate how much force do we need to push the bar on the Mars to move the world. Okay, this is a question, and. To figure out um, how much force should we put on the lever, we need to figure out um, the principle of the lever. So how does the balance work? Um, balance actually is a very easy lever. If um, the left lever and the right lever have an equal length, the lengths are the equal, then the weight unknown, we have a box, and the mass is unknown. We put the box on the left. Then we put some counterweight, we know the mass on the right. Then when they are imbalanced, the mass on the left should equal to the mass on the right. This is a case when the length on the left equal to the length on the right. Then the next question is, if L1 doesn't equal to L2, what's the relation between the mass on the left and the mass on the right if they are in balance? Suppose we have a very long bar and the standing point is here. And we have the weight here. We have a counter weight here. So what's the relation with M1, M2 if the lens are different. Here's the example. So we can do the experiment by using a very easy lever. So on the left part, on the right part, we have a lever. There is a lever. This is a lever and standing point is here, the standing point. And we put some mass on the left. And we have the weight, right? weight on the left. And we put a counterweight on the right. And we measure the distance from the center of left weight to the standing point. So we get L1. And we measure the distance on the right, we get distance L2. Then when this lever is imbalanced, it doesn't move everything is stationary, then we find the relation that is the weight on the left multiplied by the length on the left equal to the weight on the right times the length on the right. So if we change the length, then the weight will change. But eventually when everything is in stationary and everything is in balance, we have the weight times the distance is conserved. So this is a very important uh, result. And that means this product weight multiplied by the distance is a very important parameter we use to balance uh, the lever. Okay, so we define this product as torque. We define the torque equal to Weight actually is the force, right? Length is the distance. So force multiplied by distance is torque. Okay. So that means when the balance, uh, the, uh, when the lever is imbalanced, the torque conserves. Torque are equivalent on the left and on the right. Then let me write down the formula specifically. So we define the torque equal to force times the distance from the standing point uh, to the center of the mass. So if there is a spinning motion, spinning motion, and there's an object, the object 
is spinning. Then the standing point actually is axis. This is axis. So the distance from the x standing point from the axis to the mass point is the radius. So the torque is equal to the force we push the object in the motion, in the circular motion, this is the force times the radius. The radius from the axis to the object times um, the force. Okay. Um, actually, the force actually is very difficult to measure because if we want to measure the force, we have to do the free body diagram. We need to figure out the force in the tangential direction. So we don't want to measure the force. Do we have other parameter that is easy to measure and then we convert into the force? The answer is yes. We have another measurement. We can measure the acceleration. Right? From the Newton's second law, the acceleration is equal to the F force divided by the mass. So the force equal to MA. M is the mass of this point times the radius. Okay. And as I said just now, the tangential acceleration is very is a very bad parameter to use in, into this uh, circular motion because the direction change anytime. So we want to use angular acceleration. From the tangential acceleration to the angular acceleration, there is a factor R. So we have use mass times angular acceleration times radius then to replace the tangential acceleration. Then we have another radius. So in this case, we have m r squared times r. m r squared is a product and the r is the angular acceleration. In this case, we define a new parameter. We use a capital I to replace this box. Then we get something multiplied by an uh, angular acceleration. We call the MR square as the moment of inertia. This is a new name. The reason we need to define the MR square as a new parameter, because this is a constant, only depends on um, the mass and the distance of an object, right? So if we have different acceleration, we use the acceleration multiply the inertia, then we get the torque. And we we'll compare the Newton second law and the equation of the torque. The Newton's second law says force equal to MA. And we use M and A because um, this is described the linear motion. In the linear motion, mass and tangential acceleration are good parameters to do the calculation. But in the uh, rotation, the circular motion uh, Tangential acceleration is not a good parameter. So we want to use angular acceleration. That's why we use torque equals something times uh, angular acceleration. So something here has the uh, uh, same function as a mass. This is the parameter of this object. And the inertia only depends on the mass of the object and the distance from the axis the mass. Okay, so if we know the inertia, then the torque could be calculated by using the moment of inertia multiplied by, by the uh, angular acceleration. This is for the case when we have a mass point spinning uh, with the axis. Then the next question is, if the object is not a mass point, it's a disk or any object, how can we get the moment of inertia? Right. So for any point of mass, the inertia is m r square. But if we have a disk, spinning disk, 
um, we cannot treat the spinning disk as a mass point, but we can separate uh, this disk uh, into several many points of mass. So we can divide the disk into small elements. Each element is a mass point. Each element has a small mass I call EM. I call it EM and each mass has a radius from the center of the mass to the axis. So R is a function of M, right? Mass is a function of R, doesn't matter. So um, to get the inertia, we have to do the integration. So for each small mass, uh, we multiply by the distance from the axis to the mass center square. Then we do the integration. That's the inertia of the spinning object. Then we multiply by the angular acceleration, they'll get the torque. So in this case, I just switch the mR square into an integration. So in this case, the torque to be equal to an integration multiply the radius square a small mass times the acceleration. Then this part is the inertia of the spinning disk. And in the real time, you don't need to calculate this integration because um, if the shape change, the inertia will change. But we provide you a table. This table just describe if you have different elements, if you have different spinning object, the inertia to be found in this table. You find that if you have a spinning rod, you have a spinning disc, spinning hoop, spinning sphere, and spinning shell, the inertia are different. You don't need to do the integration to get the inertia, but I give you the table. From this table, you don't need to memorize this number. We will provide you this number, but what you need to know is what does the inertia depend on? From the relation, we have radius, EM, this is our inertia. So the inertia depends on the shape, the shape of the spinning object. You can find the rod and the slab and the disc they have different inertia, right? Because the shape depends on the integration, the up limit and the down limit. So you get different inertia. The second one, the inertia depends on where the axis is. Even you have the same object, you have the same rod but the axis is at a different position. The first case, the axis is in the center. The second case, the axis is on the edge. You get a different inertia. Because when the axis change, the R will change, right? The radius will change. If the radius change, the inertia will change. So be careful. When you do the calculation, you need to figure out what's the correct inertia. You're going to look Look for the table and find the number of inertia, then do the calculation. Okay, so I show you an example, how to calculate the inertia and how to use the inertia to get the torque. And we have um, uh, a bore, two bores. There's a dumb bore. We have two meter long bar and the bar is four kilogram and the bar, each one has 0.3 kilogram. And let's see, we're going to find the moment of inertia. If the axis is perpendicular to the bar through the center, okay, through the center, we have three elements, right? Left bar, right bar, and uh, uh, hold up, the bar and the bar. The bar, we can use the formula of the rod. We use this one. So the axis is through the center. The moment inertia is 1 12th ml square. So for the part A, the inertia 
equal to the inertia of left bore, inertia of the right bore, and the inertia of the bar. Left, right. Okay. The bar is one twelfth mass length square. The mass is four kilogram. The length is two meter. Okay. So this is inertia of the bar. How about the bore? The bore is a mass point, right? So we are going to use the mass point, the equation is m r squared. m is a mass, that's a 0.3. The radius is the distance from the center of the axis to the center of the mass. And that's a meet one meter. Okay. And then we have two bar, so we multiply by two. Okay, this is the first question. Second question, perpendicular to the bar through one of the bar. This case. So we have three elements, left bore, right bore, and the bar. The left bore, the center of the mass, and the center of axis are at the same position. So the radius is zero. The inertia is zero for the left bore. On the right bore, the distance is L, that's two meter, right? The mass is 0.3. So the left bore equal to M R square. M is 0.3, R is two meter. And the bar, we're going to use this table, second one, when the axis is on the edge, that's one third M L square. One third. M L square. M is four kilogram. L two meter. Okay, that's a part B. Part C parallel to the bar through both bore. This one. So all the elements has a radius equal to zero. You can find the center of the bar to the center of the axis is zero. And the bar is on the axis, so the radius is also zero. And the second bar has a zero radius, so the inertia is zero. Part D, if they are parallel to axis and 0.5 meter from it, so every element could be treated as a mass point because all the elements have the same radius. If they have the same radius, if you check the integration r squared dm, every mass has the same distance. So the distance could be take out the radius times the integration of dm. This is a total mass. The total mass means the mass of the bore and the mass of the bar. The mass of the bore is 0.3 times 2, you have two bores plus the mass of the, of the bar, that's 4 kilogram. The radius is 0.5. Okay, that's the inertia, how we determine the inertia from the shape and the distance of axis. So that's what I'm talking today. Do you have any questions? 